Mike Doyle, Executive Director of Illinois Community Shares, is joining me today for community planning conversations. In the spirit of, of uh, truth here, uh, Mike and I were classmates during graduate school, in fact, uh, classmates in a very important class that was the foundation for what eventually became the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers. Mike, thank you very much for uh, joining me this afternoon. And the purpose of asking you to uh, have the conversation with me really focuses on what is called UCAN, U hyphen C A N, United Citizens and Neighbors. But I want to remind our viewers uh, because we've had conversations on two entities that you are deeply involved with, one very closely as executive director of Community Shares, and Esther Pat came and mm -hmm. talked to us about uh, that organization, and then you were uh, very instrumental in the establishment of the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers, and the present director, Claudia Linhoff, uh, came and talked to us and shared information about that. And you were equally as instrumental in starting you can. So uh, let's just start out by uh, your telling us a bit about this Urbana neighborhood organization. Sure. Well, you can represents the north end of uh, Urbana, uh, north of University generally, along the Champaign border over to around Cunningham Avenue, uh, loosely defined. And it really started in the mid 90s around. Uh, major expansion project where Carl Hospital was looking at expanding into the neighborhood and uh, it was going to have a significant impact on those who lived around Carl. So the organization really came together around that whole issue uh, and in response to Carl's plans and a lot of concerns about uh, people in the neighborhood and their interests and how they would be represented in the process. So that's when we began uh, and then uh, we've been around now for probably 12 years and uh, the organization is involved in a lot of different things. We've developed and helped build some affordable housing, rehabbing housing in the neighborhood we currently there's meetings with the King School principal talking about kids in the neighborhood. Some members of the organization are involved in mentoring at the school. So it's a very diverse uh, type of agenda, but it's about the people who live in the North Urbana community. Uh, well, let's go back to uh, the first uh, incident that brought you all together and around Carl Hospital. Why don't you just briefly talk about that and and the win-win situation that ended sure. up being developed. Well, it was a time when Carl had, you know, expanded over the years. So over the probably 10 or 15 years before UCAN came around in the 80s and 90s, there had often been sort of skirmishes and conflicts about closing of streets, building of uh, bridges over certain streets, and, and neighbors had reacted to those plans. So there was some tension that existed. But in the mid-90s, around 93, 94, Carl wanted to develop a whole campus-wide plan, sort of a master plan for their area that looked out 15, 20 years. And some of that plan would have had significant impact on the housing available. Uh, they were looking at expanding several blocks to the north, which could jeopardize several uh, dozen houses. Uh, toward the housing, fairgrounds. Toward the fairgrounds fair in Urbana. Okay. Uh, and so it, people were concerned about that. What was the impact on their property values? Plus, Carl was asking the city for a lot of different kinds of things, from closing streets to buying up property and so forth. And I think the residents felt, as people who also resided in that neighborhood, that they had a lot of concerns and interests. And if the city was going to move forward with this master plan, it shouldn't just come from the perspective and the plan of the institution mm -hmm. that sort of dominated the landscape. But really, the other people who lived in the neighborhood had a lot of issues and concerns. And if we were going to do this, it really needed to be a broader community-wide planning process. So it went on for probably about 12, 18 months. There was a point where there was just disagreement over how big the expansion would be, how far it would go north. There were concerns Carl owned a lot of property in the neighborhood, a lot of rental housing, which wasn't being maintained. So property values were decreasing because of a lot of this rental property. And those of us who lived in the neighborhood, we saw our property values being hurt by this low rundown uh, rental housing mm -hmm. that Carl maintained. For them, because they kept wanting to buy property, there was really a self-interest to depress the price of it. So when they wanted to buy up new homes, it didn't hurt them. In fact, it was probably to their benefit mm -hmm. that that happened. I don't think it was strategically planned that way, but I mean, I think that was our concern. So as we started 
started looking at what the neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood started meeting, talking about what the plans would mean. Those are the kinds of things that came up on our agenda. Well, if we're going to do this, then Carl needs to be a partner on a variety of levels. They need to improve the rental housing. It needs to be inspected by the city. It needs to be brought up to code. And so there was a whole wide range of issues that were sort of thrown onto the table. Uh, there was a neighborhood investment fund that came out of that to help uh, other people in the neighborhood with sort of their needs since they were, Carl was getting certain kinds of discounts or breaks from the city, closing streets and so forth. We felt like, well, what about the other kinds of needs in the neighborhood? So in the end, and again, it probably um, lasted for almost two years, um, it got down to sort of Carl's position and the neighborhood's position. And at the very end, uh, city council member Mario Ryan uh, and Jim Hayes, who represented sort of the neighborhood, mm -hmm. helped pull together a meeting between Carl and the residents. And we sort of went point by point down the thing. And we compromised on certain things, the density of their expansion down the road, what would be how far north they would go, how many homes would they sell back to make it affordable in the neighborhood. So there again, there were a wide range of issues that I think both sides had concern about. And in the end, we were able to come to some compromise that both parties endorsed. The city council, it was, I mean, it really, there were a number of hearings. It was very, one of those intense uh, Ba ba uh, battles that was going on, but in the end it was a unanimous vote that was supported both by the hospital and the neighborhood residents. So it was a process that I think had value in terms of the final outcome for the city, the people who live there, as well as the institution. Uh, Carl and hospital. is this all still in place? It is. There's a master plan there, and Carl, as part of the process that came out of that, they have neighborhood meetings where they talk to the residents about what they're thinking about, what's going on, so people don't feel like they're getting blindsided with plans. But what was nice about it, it was a 20-year plan that really looked out to the future. Okay. So the people had some sense of stability and what was going to be happening in their neighborhood. Carl sold off a number of the properties further to the north. There was a line of how far it would go. There was a campus in which they had control and didn't have to come back for changes. So I think it sort of laid a framework that made everyone feel comfortable and it really um, diminished the amount of conflict that existed in the neighborhood before that plan was in place, before everyone felt like they owned part of the decision. Uh, I think that that was something that there uh, was just sort of these skirmishes. Every time Carl wanted something, they sort of would gear up for fighting it and the residents, so here they come again and they would sort of resist to it. And I think we were able to diffuse that so that that's not the way development's going on in the neighborhood now. Ashley, when you think about it, uh, you have about another 10 years on that plan. That's right. Or nine years on the plan, <laughs> depending on, you know, how the dates uh, uh, come down. But anyway, as you're talking about, I'm thinking about how much has now been saved in transaction costs for both Carl, I mean, this is a win-win situation, sure. even though you indicated there was a lot of negotiation and compromise, but still the bottom line is it was a win-win situation because there's stability now in this neighborhood. You know what your values are and you know where Carl has sort of drawn the line at the back the boundaries so and, and 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 I think it's made us all better neighbors you know a little more dialogue a little less fear and, and tension about each other right. so I think that's been good to right. the process there was after that one of the issues that came up during the planning process that was not addressed within it was uh, Carl was at the time had a uh, medical waste incinerator and it was mm -hmm. one of the things that was high on our agenda we didn't like the smoke being dumped in the neighborhood we knew it was hazardous dioxin comes out of those medical waste incinerators they're now being phased out around the country but this back then they were all over right. and um, so we, uh, you know, and, and it was a very educational process for us as citizens. You know, these are just average people, average homeowners, low to middle income. Uh, and uh, to sit in those meetings, and we had to give up some things that we didn't feel like we're not going to win this, you know, and let's get what we can. What do we care about? When that process ended, one of the things that we took off the table, and they agreed they're not going to do them, we said, okay, it's not going to be part of this agreement, was the medical waste incinerator. The neighborhood group then mobilized outside of the agreement to get the medical waste incinerator not only at Carl but also at Provena, which is not in our neighborhood but um, right. over to the closer to Champaign. Uh, and we were able to get that shut down. So it was another victory outside of the planning process. It was one where when Carl was unwilling or unable to negotiate on that, we took it to the city, uh, to the residents overall. There was a referendum that was passed overwhelmingly, led to the city council voting to shut down all the medical waste incinerators in Urbana. And again, now that's seen as the best public policy. The state of yeah. Illinois has banned them everywhere. But it was, right. it was a very interesting thing where you right. saw people who knew nothing about medical waste, knew nothing about dioxin. And, you know, I mean, those of us would drive home at night we'd drive through the smoke that would be in the neighborhood and now that's all gone so it's kind of a nice thing for us to have and uh, again it was another benefit I think that the process helped push further along educate a lot of us and led to some good outcomes for the city and uh, leaders within the state 
being that's true. Unbelieving that's true. I mean, we were dealing. We had people dioxins. coming down. From, yeah. <laughs> we had people coming down from Chicago. How did you guys do this? What did you do? Exactly. And doing that. So I think it was something that, um, you know, which is another great thing I think about neighborhood groups is you can sort of learn from one another and what works and gather that information uh, and share it with others. Now you mentioned uh, being involved with uh, King School, which is on Fairlawn, just um, west of Lincoln. Right. And um, also in that area is a um, new low-cost housing uh, that's being built uh, by Ecolab, right. Katrine Klingenberg. But now, are you all involved at all in that project and bringing some of these low-energy, low-income uh, low homes to your to your to area? To our neighborhood? I don't... I could be mistaken. I don't think we've had any direct role, so they deserve the credit for doing that. We're very supportive of it. UCAN okay. has been involved in rehabbing housing in the neighborhood. We're volunteers okay. and with support from the city to take a run, dilapidated, boarded up building and rehab it. Uh, one of our board members currently got involved in the organization when she moved in because she bought one of the homes that was rehabbed by UCAN. So um, we have been involved in the whole issue of trying to make the housing better and be proactive uh, in terms of doing that. Um, we have been very involved with King's School. There was a, a major push. This was probably, again, I'm trying to get my years right, but I would say somewhere around 2000, um, where the school was overcrowded. Mm -hmm. uh, the city was under pressure to mm -hmm. allow the African-American kids in the neighborhood, it was largely african neighborhood to go to their neighborhood school rather than be bused and put the burden on the black community in terms of busing of students uh, to bring those kids into the school though really made it crowded so this the school district was looking at doing some stuff and what you can came around and did is brought back an issue from back in the late 80s early 90s where the school district had done just minimal expansion at King School to alleviate some of the overcrowding there uh, and said oh we don't have enough money to do these extra classrooms which were really needed in the meantime in another neighborhood in Urbana they had made a a magnificent expansion at a neighborhood that school that was in a much more well-to-do neighborhood and overexpanded, built excess rooms that they weren't even going to use but wanted to build them there just in case they might need them in the future. And so you can got very involved uh, in the overcrowding issue and pushed the school board to make a commitment to add those rooms that were needed at King School from 10 years earlier. Uh, we worked with the uh, state representative Tom Byrne and then later with Naomi Jacobson to get some state funding to help do that. But uh, as a result of that work that UCAN very much spearheaded with the PTA at King School was the expansion of King School to meet the neighborhood needs and allow the neighborhood kids go to school there. So, you know, over the years, the, the neighborhood organization has been involved in it. UCAN's been a lot of different things. You know, it in ebbs and it flows. Uh, I was different just things. You know, it's never this. It always sounds good when you're telling <laughs> yeah. the Right, stories. Right. <laughs> After the fact. Oh, they're it, great it, when it's it, all over with. It's all over with, yes. I mean, actually, you just, you, you guessed my next uh, thought here, and that is um, how does any organization, be it community shares or the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers or uh, these number of neighborhood uh, organizations that exist in Urbana, um, um, how do you keep the interest yeah. level, or if it isn't at a constant level, when it is necessary to recharge because something else has come up that is very important? Um, well, I think, you know... Is, what are some of the key organizing? Well, that's what I was going to say. As you know, from my background, when we were in school together, or planning, one of the things that I'm very interested in involved in is community organizing, to build these institutions, to give voice to people who currently uh, don't have that. And I think there is a value in maintaining some structure that go, is ongoing beyond the individuals who come and go within an organization. So my first response is, how does this happen, is it really is this average people stepping up and taking a leadership role in the neighborhood that they might not have thought they did or in an issue that they care about that somehow touches them personally, and they say, I have to speak out on this. I have to show up at a city council. I have to go to a neighborhood meeting and find out. So I think that's the spark is people's self-interest is somehow going to be affected, and they want to have a say in that. Um, the key after that is really building some kind of a structure that allows between the ebbs and flows. And it's harder on a small neighborhood group, I think, like you can or some of the urban groups, where you don't have staff, you don't necessarily have an office. Don't uh, have probably much of a budget. Don't have much of a budget, budget at all, and you're on. sort of getting along. So right. I think it, it is trying to figure out some structure and allowing and recognizing there's ebbs and flows in that and not being afraid that, oh, there's not a lot going on. Because, you know, it is what motivates, you know, we're all very busy. We have family responsibilities. We have work responsibilities. And it is, in some ways, a reaction to things going on. You want it to be proactive as much as possible. But sometimes you just have to recognize when, when an issue comes along, people 
there's a gathering place. There's an organization with a name that has a history that people have confidence that they can be part of. So uh, I think there are those ebbs and flows, and you just sort of ride the wave sometimes. But what about some of the other organizing strategies that I know that you have used and I'd like to get you to share it with our viewers, and is how prepared do you and your the group get themselves in the way of data and sure. facts and figures? and being transparent in your process and some sure. of those aspects. Well, and I think if you're, um, every organization in the board has to sort of decide what their role is. So I think it's like in UCAM, which I've been very involved with over the years, we don't picture ourselves necessarily having 10 staff people and doing a lot of stuff, but we want to be a vehicle to give, again, voice to those of us to address some of those issues. When it's come time, like in the incinerator, we reached out to the university, uh, to students uh, who had science backgrounds, students had planning oh, backgrounds. so you took advantage of a knowledge base here in the exactly. community. Exactly. And okay. I think that's a role we're in Champaign-Urbana very lucky to have, is there's great resources and talent okay. and people. So we would reach out to those, and those people helped us gather information, were very useful. Uh, there was a Physicians for Social Response responsibility chapter of students here at the university that were very active and had access to resources for their national organization. So I think sometimes you're, you're drawing on that expertise. When we were dealing with the uh, Carl issue and the expansion, we went to the urban planning department where there were a couple of graduate students who helped us come with an alternative plan. So when Carl had their mm -hmm. huge plan that I'm mm -hmm. sure they spent hundreds if not hundreds of thousands, not millions of dollars on, we said we've got to have some plan. We can't just say we're against everything. Expert student labor. <laughs> and that's right. But we did a great job, I thought, in articulating right. what our perspective was. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we had to get examples of other communities where a neighborhood investment fund played a role and stuff like that. So I think you try and reach out. Groups like Healthcare Consumers, which is now almost 30 years old, you know, that we, you're telling when we were in school together. That's right. And <laughs> it, they have a professional staff. They have, you know, five, six, seven staff people. They have a budget. They have an office. So, I mean, hopefully you can build that kind of institution that serves as a vehicle for an ongoing voice. And, you know, as with healthcare consumers, sometimes the issue is uh, birth control for women. Sometimes it's midwives. Sometimes it's access to care for the poor. It really changes over time and the constituency. But well, I think those of us who are involved in healthcare consumers, we want to create an organization that, again, when people, it wasn't geographically based, but in this whole broad issue of health care, when someone has a problem, gee, I don't like the fact that the university is not covering my birth control for women, let's go to the healthcare consumers. And there they have the, both the resources and the expertise to help organize people to have their voice be heard at the university or whatever the issue might be. You, you really made um, um, a point to be underlined, and that is using the resources at the university and oftentimes tapping into many of the departments where you can get graduate students who might very much be interested in this as a research project or as a master's level workshop thesis project. So there's an awful lot of talent. There is. And, well, and both of us, as you mentioned at the outset, you know, I mean, we got involved in this. Yes, we did. It's a class. A class on citizen system. participation exactly when the Health Systems Agency Act was passed on the federal level. That's so right. it started. So, yeah. And so I think, and so as students, uh, that was how I, you know, sort of sunk my roots into the community, but also got very engaged in healthcare as an issue, and it was a great learning experience. It helped me an awful lot. And so I think there are a lot of students who come to the university to get their education, but they're also looking to make what they're learning something have a real impact in the world. And I think that community groups need to understand that, and we need to reach out to those departments. You know, sometimes you have a hit or miss thing, but there's a lot of young people who are looking to do it. There's a lot of professors who want to find a role so that they can apply their expertise and knowledge in the community. Absolutely, and, and it's a win-win situation, as you talked about how you all worked with Carl in it right. coming out to be a win-win situation. So I'm sure all our viewers are just terribly interested is this activism in your DNA, or <laughs> <laughs> did it, did it uh, come about as you were a, a graduate student and well, you know, reading Saul Alinsky? Or? Well, yeah, I grew up in Chicago, so it was a neighborhood with a neighborhood organization, so okay. I was sort of exposed to it as growing up. You know, and when I grew up, there was an organizer who would come around, and uh, so it and was which, real that which, way. Which area? Of Chicago? Well, the south side of Chicago. Okay. I lived in uh, on the south side of the city. But I also had a um, my stepfather was an ex Jesuit priest who worked with Solinsky. So he used to sit around okay. the dinner table and tell Solinsky stories. stories. So okay. that I, it was also probably a significant impact on how I view the world. So when I came here, <laughs> got involved in urban planning. I thought I was going to go to law school and become a lawyer. And all of a sudden, I found these issues that we would talk about as planners. 
working for a city or something, we want to do this, what's the impact on the neighborhood? Who's going to represent their viewpoint? You know, you have the, whether it's lobbyists or an institution that have higher planners, what about all those other people that are affected but don't have a mechanism for it? And I just, it connected back to my childhood, to the stories I heard, and it made a connection, and so that's where I found myself just in the last Just went off from years. there. Well, um, and, and this is a long time ago. Um, it was still a fairly nascent group of the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers um, and Ralph Nader. That's right. Yeah. He's you been brought, very supportive. Yes, he's been very supportive of this. So um, I'd like to tie this up a bit with um, what has happened in both of our communities recently, and that has to do with the no smoking mm -hmm. ordinance, and not so much from the issue of no smoking, but more from the perspective of this was, oh, maybe... 12 to 15 months worth of community activism on an issue and um, which turned uh, successful if you're for the uh, no smoking. If not, you, you don't feel uh, that it was successful. But what was the sustaining aspects of this and working with two communities, one more inclined toward it than the other, meaning your van was a little bit right. more inclined, than Champaign, uh, again, how can we learn from this sure. as a process? Well, and I was not involved in that. No, no, so I know I, that. So, but as an observer, as someone in the as community. As an observer and as somebody who is a community organizer. Sure. You know, I mean, what I thought, uh, I think that the citizen output, uh, the participation on a variety of levels, really made the difference in whether this passed in both cities or not. So I clearly think that the uh, people speaking up, saying their thing, and there were a lot of people on both sides very articulate about their perspective, but clearly the final decision I think had a different uh, outcome from some of the city council members than it would have if just it came up as a proposal without sort of citizen input. I have a feeling there would probably be more inclination against passing it, and it passed probably because so many people spoke out, because I think there were people who voted in favor of it who I don't think are traditionally inclined to vote that way. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it. What I was very impressed with with the people who were involved in that, and I think they deserve a pat on the back, was maintaining it, because it came up and it took a long time, and it often does. These things you think is going to be a couple of meetings, but it it took them, like you said, 18 months or more. Well, I've, I've I'm I'm guessing not, but that somewhat is the timeline that's Yeah, no, it came up I'm, early, and then it sort of took a back seat for a while, and then it right. reemerged, and part of it was getting enough momentum going. So I think part of it, one of my big beliefs is it takes persistence, and that you really have to stick with it. And so clearly there were leaders on the non-smoking side who really wanted to see, because it's harder to pass something than it is to stop it. So I think their ability to keep the attention of the people in the community, to keep the pressure on, to keep meeting with city council people probably played a key role in that. And again, I think it's a good example where you had some very um, specific interests in terms of the bars and the restaurants who were opposed to it. They have both resources, they're already organized, mm -hmm. uh, they have a network that they can use, and they have resources available to them. So in general, they're in a better position, and all they're trying to do is block something from happening, whereas mm -hmm. the other people are trying to implement something new, which is a little more difficult. So I think it was a good example where sort of the broader community in terms of, you know, there is no one group of people who care about not having smoking uh, in the restaurants. I mean, it isn't like there's a, a financial interest out there. It's really average citizens coming together to make sure that their voices are heard and overcoming, I think, the resistance of other people. And it isn't to say one side is better or worse. I think I, I enjoy seeing communities tackle, debate, and try and resolve issues that maybe at first blush don't seem like you can do it. And, and sometimes one side wins, sometimes the other. Sometimes you can have a compromise that mm -hmm. both sides feel they got something out of it. Mm -hmm. But I do think, you know, in democracy it's not always that clean and, and there is differing viewpoints and there are sometimes winners and losers, but it's if the process can be uh, open and people have an opportunity to have a say on it, I think uh, we're all better off for it. Even sometimes when we lose or we win, I think we're better off from that kind of a process. Uh, you, and hopefully, I think, you know, I've seen some follow-up articles on the business owners where some of the restaurants are saying, you know, it's not affecting stuff. So that I understand that they may be afraid of that, but maybe in the end it wasn't uh, a fear that they needed to worry about. But um, the fact that we went through the process, came up with the decision, I think is good for the community. It was quite an open process. It was. Too. Um, I had a member of the Urbana uh, City Council as, um, I guess, not too long ago, and we talked about the openness of the process with the public meeting at the Carl Forum. Forum. Um, 
not, not everybody considered that a neutral space. I was thinking of it neutral in the sense it wasn't in either city council <laughs> right. chambers, but it was at a medical facility. And But that opened it up for a lot of conversation yeah. to occur um, around that. Um, but you and I have lived in the community, these two communities, for quite a long, a long time now. And when we look back historically uh, over our communities, it is not very often that we have uh, great citizen input that uh, really affects how the final decision is made or even right. causes a paradigm shift and therefore then how the vote comes out. Uh, do you have any sense um, of, about our two communities? I'm not saying our communities are the same. We know they're not. Right. But still, overall, neither community is is strongly active community if we juxtapositioned ourselves against, say, Madison, Wisconsin, or Boulder, or... Right. I, you know, as a, as a community organizer, having grown up in Chicago, there is clearly a, there's a different cultural dynamic, I think, in mm -hmm. terms of um, downstate, middle-sized community like Champaign-Urbana, and maybe Chicago, you know, how Bloomington Normal compares to Champaign. I don't necessarily know that much about it, but I do think my experience has been that the smaller communities tend to be a little more open and that the um, some of the organizing going on is a little less aggressive. And I just think it's sort of the dynamic of maybe a smaller or mid mid-sized community in terms of that. One of the things that I think plays a big role that sometimes we don't always think about is the reaction of elected officials to this kind of a process. That oftentimes you can okay. find elected officials who, you know, they work with their if they come up with a plan and they put it out there and they become defensive of the plan rather than seeing it as the first step of the process and they're looking to push it through rather than to say here's what we've come up with now let's we know that there's going to be different views different interests and we want to sort of nurture it and I think if you look at some of the things I think the the smoking thing happened a little bit in terms of uh, Mayor Prussing I think was very open to this let's have it it wasn't like I think it's a bad idea so I'm going to kill it early but so it doesn't go anywhere and I think sometimes you have elected officials who have that approach to it and I think that's unfortunate but the dynamic of the elected official and how they respond to wanting to have that kind of because again it gets a little messy and sometimes they want to control the fallout one way or the other or not get a bad decision but I think if a uh, an elected official whether that's a, a mayor or whether it's city council people can be open to that and nurture and try and listen and understand it's a far better process and outcome than if they um, sort of feel like they know what they want and then resist that kind of uh, input from other people. And I think the city officials uh, apply to any elected official and sometimes elected officials are just in there so long that they become a little jaded to the process and sometimes mm. are less willing to listen. And I always think it's good for people who are elected office to, after a few years, step aside and let someone else do it and, and maybe come back to it if they want. But I think sometimes people are so often in that position that they lose touch with the openness that they might have first had when they first came down. So I'm sure you, it's tough when your phone's constantly ringing and people are complaining. And, and so it's inevitable, I think, that you might shift as an elected official from being open to being resistant to hearing more complaints and stuff like that. But um, I think that's a dynamic that often isn't uh, taken into account when we look at these issues as they come up and how they're resolved. But I right. think elected officials have a big impact on the process and how it works out. So it, uh, you're suggesting that there is a, a real important balance between the longitudinality and the um, institutional history that one can offer uh, for being in office a number of years or a city even a city manager being in um, position for a number of years as juxtaposition to what you've just described and that is just kind of wearing out Right. And, yeah, I think, and, you know, and, I, I and get and getting tired. And, and I have a lot of friends who have been in the elected <laughs> office and I've never run for office, but I know that it takes its toll over time. And so sometimes you recognize that and do it. You know, I go back on the Carl issue. It was very intense at various points in time. It did come out with a win-win, but I always point to two city council people, Jim Hayes and uh, Mario Ryan, who 
behind the scenes when it looked like there wasn't going to be a compromise and the vote was going to happen, they pulled the parties together and said, come on, let's see if we can work this out. And they played a very positive role in, again, allowing the parties to have some space where they could talk through what their fears were, what, their, mm -hmm. what they wanted to have. And, I, and again, I think they, that, the meetings that they pulled together right before the vote on that were critical to the neighborhood feeling good about the proposal and Carl feeling good about the proposal, which led to a unanimous vote. So I do think that sometimes city officials, elected officials are in a position to nurture and facilitate that and too often they feel like they align themselves with one side or the other and they get in the way of uh, bringing about a resolution. Or a really good open discussion right. to, the, to get to that resolution. Right. Um, let me pull back. Uh, you caused me to think about this when you mentioned uh, tapping into the expertise that's at the university. Um, one of the uh, really interesting things that I observe is I um, teach workshops, mm -hmm. and you probably remember this from our days as students, that students um, have a really interesting positive effect when they're brought into a situation to work because they sort of diffuse things because they have no history with the agency or the issue or whatever it is, right. and they're very open. They don't come in with any boilerplate right. ideas. So oftentimes, um, well, as an example, we did a huge charrette uh, in Macomb last fall semester, uh -huh. and there were 120 uh -huh. community members who came to the charrette. And because it was the students really running everything and um, garnering the uh, conversations, taking the notes, doing the designing right on the spot and things like that, that it created an environment that was much more open and positive for people who at any other meeting might be at each other's That's true. throats, which, you know, they come in with what we call that garbage bag full of <laughs> history and arguments. Right. And so this is uh, another positive for involving the students because it's a really educational process on both sides. Students learn how to do citizen participation but then offer to the situation this sort of neutral environment that they right. can create to enhance conversation. Well, and as you're saying, I remember back on the Carl issue, um, there were consultants that had been brought in but they were being paid by one of the parties. And it isn't to say that, that you know, it's sort of nice, like, hey, we'll have our person come in, but for one of the parties, like, well, who's this person in terms of, you know, they're moving me toward their client's point of view, and I don't want to be manipulated that way. And uh, so I think bringing an outside party, bringing in the university's expertise sometimes can avoid that, who are you working for, because they're just there for the process itself. And, 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 and mostly for learning. Right. To that's get what they want to get, right. what they want to get out of it, and they have haven't um, been a professional to any length of time so that what we call boilerplate where they just have certain solutions in their heads and they're under a time pressure and so they just overlay. Pull out the one they used in the last place. One, yeah. and, just, and, just, and just lay it over. Um, what um, lessons um, from your experience, and again, using our recent case study of what's happened in the communities that related to smoking, again, not the way the vote ended up, sure. but that the activism, um, and what you talked about that sometimes people in the decision-making roles just, you get, you get tired right. uh, and you just don't want to learn one more thing. So uh, for those people who are being the activists, what are some of the tools, persuasive tools, that you have found to be most effective? Yeah. Well, you know, each situation requires sort of its own approach to it. But, I, you know, part of it is I, I've been in a few instances where a third party helps sort of mediate the difference. So sometimes we get locked into our positions, the community group and an elected official, a community group and an institution, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you have a hard time coming to agreement because you feel like if I agree with you, uh, I'm giving up what I'm standing for. So I think that sometimes you have to find someone else who's willing to be a go-between. I mean, so that there are sometimes backdoor communications where someone can say, oh, you know, really? they really... Oh, really? Backdoor communication? Yeah, where, where okay. it's like, could you let them know that we want to do this? I think one of the things that I've noticed in, in UCAN and some of the neighborhood issues has been um, 
we can, even as community, you know, I've been a little critical of saying sometimes elected officials can be resistant. I think that happens on the um, neighborhood side, community side sometimes, is that we fight so hard for what we believe mm -hmm. that then when it comes time to vote on it, inevitably in a legislative process, whether city council, state, there's some compromises. And I think people who are new to this process feel like they have to win everything. And it rarely goes that way. So part of it is making sure everyone understands that here's our position and we're going to hold and try and get as much as we can. But the reality is there are other competing interests other than ours. And we need to find out, is there a place where we can get most of what we want, maybe all of what we want, but probably just most of what we want, and accommodate what they're concerned about. So it requires sometimes letting go of you know our position. So we're there arguing, this is what we want to do, we want to do this. But when the final solution comes, you're going to have to do most of that, but not all of it. And so I think, again, making sure people are open to compromise, which is not an easy thing to do when you've been for six months hammering away at your position, and now you can't get everything that you want. Can people get around that? Um, and so for us on the, you know, when there was the whole uh, smokestack, the medical waste incinerators, people really wanted it. When it was coming to make a deal, it was becoming a deal breaker because Carl didn't want to deal with it at all, and we really wanted it to be in the, the final thing. We had, a, we had a, and it was a big debate within us whether we would agree to anything if it, the medical waste mm -hmm. incinerator was there. So we had to come to those terms in our own group, in our own way, outside of the meeting with other people and say, what do we do? And, you know, I think our decision to go ahead with agreeing to the... Separate the issues. Separate the two issues. Mm -hmm. Partly we felt like we're going to win this outside of this arena, so we'll we'll take it there. <laughs> but part of it was getting people to let go of that, and we're going to have to fight that battle another day, and um, that's not an easy thing to do. And so I think, uh, you know, and again, I don't know on the, I thought the thing in the debate around the smoking, what I saw were public officials being very open to different arguments, responding to it, and, and shifting. I mean, again, I, I don't want to name names, but there were a few people who I thought for sure were going to vote against something like that and be opposed to it from their initial reaction to it, who came and voted for it. And to me, that means they were open and they were listening, and, and I think that's a positive thing. So I'm not sure I know enough about how they got some of those people to go around. Was it just good articulation of their points of view? Mm -hmm. um, sometimes one-on-one -on -one meetings are useful. Sometimes it's just not realizing how many people feel strongly about this. So for a lot of you know, a lot of times you have to demonstrate there's broad public support because what happens is you have the two interest groups sort of arguing their points and you're sitting there as elected officials like, well, you both are saying good things and so, and it's like, well, no, there's a broader community. So I know on our medical waste incinerator, Carl wanted it, the people in the neighborhood didn't, and as a city council person, you can say, well, you know, what do I do? And so what we did as a neighborhood group, we said, well, let's ask the citizens if they want to vote on something like this and, and had a referendum and it, when it passed 70 some percent to 20 some percent, it was pretty clear to elected officials like even in places on the other end of Urbana, two thirds, three quarters of their residents were voting for this thing. It's like, okay, well, why am I against this? And again, right. so I think there are ways where you can help city council elected officials to move a little bit, um, but a lot of it is just... Uh, being in there and engaging yourself, I think, and allowing people. I always feel like, too, if an elected official is resistant, we've got to understand what it is that they're worried about. And again, try and find if once you identify that concern or fear, are the ways that we can address that uh, outside of uh, our original position. Well, again, you, you, you knew exactly what I was going to ask because if you were going to give a, a um, an informal training session on <laughs> community activism and the things that community activists uh, need to be thinking about on um, best approaches sort of to um, um, make the thinking just uncomfortable enough so that means that they think about it but not so uncomfortable that all the doors are closed. Right. That close down because it's just too uncomfortable. Do you ever strategize? Um, this is a uh, this is a ploy of a, a unnamed but very famous social planner, and that is to build and what people talk about is throwaways. Well, you know, I, I, and meaning that there are things there that you the group doesn't feel that strongly about, and that allows you to give negotiating points so the other side feels that sure. they have. Sure. I mean, I, I think it's 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 throwaways in the terminology meaning you don't you don't put things in there that you don't really want, but you recognize there's some things you care more about than other right. things. Right. Yeah. yeah. So in that sense, absolutely. And I would say also is, so when you're in negotiations, I think you have all your things that you care about. And I can remember city council saying, well, which ones do you want? And it's like, well, we want them all. 
what can we get? And that'll be dependent upon how well we can articulate our positions, how well that they're... So, I mean, it's hard to know what is a throwaway and what isn't a throwaway. I mean, I don't, I'm not for padding your list of things so that there's things you really don't even want. So you, but I do think, clearly, if you ranked what you care most about, what you care least about, uh, it's easier to say, okay, we're just going to let go of that. It's not as important as this thing here. We'd rather save houses. We would like to keep the street open, but that's not nearly as important as the safety concerns around or something like that. So I think there is that um, ranking of what's important what isn't. I think another factor that really comes into play for neighborhood groups um, is building up confidence among people. And again, your average people who are new to all this stuff, uh, they're intimidated by a lot of it. And also the confidence that I can be right about this. So a lot of times in mm. planning out something like this, you want to build in smaller victories. So we got this committee to approve it. We've got this step to happen. And so that you have some success in building confidence of people, creating environments where people have the opportunity to step up and speak out and do a good job and feel good about it and stuff like that. So I think there are, there are lots of sort of internal things which you're always looking at in terms of building the leadership, building the confidence of the people in, uh, who are involved in that, as well as building some momentum uh, politically. So uh, too often, I shouldn't say too often, a lot of times groups will set a goal of, you know, we want to shut down the nuclear waste industry, and you're just not going to do that right away. So what can we do in smaller <laughs> steps and sort of build up to that and try and get closer to your goal overall? And when uh, you've mentioned a couple of times where you've gone to uh, for some political help beyond the city councils, what are some of the things that uh, you use uh, to make that decision to sort of go up to the, as we say, the next notch? Sure. Well, I think in all of the... Um, when you're setting out a strategy at the beginning, what you always want to know is who has the power to give us what we want. Okay. Because sometimes you find yourself arguing with someone who couldn't do it anyway. So okay. who is it that there uh, really influences them? So a lot of times you're sort of in your planning process identifying what are pressure points or who has the ability to do it. So when we were fighting it around King School and to have the expansion of King School to have it built, well, clearly the school board was in a position to make some commitment there and to follow up on previous commitments. But we also recognized that they were in a very tight budget and it was going to be difficult there. So who had the ability to do it? So the state became a vehicle okay. where they were talking about where there was a number of projects could be in member districts so then it was saying well we the school district needs to step up but we also recognize that they're going to need to be money here to make this a reality so meetings were held with state representative Tom Byrne who helped get the commitment for some additional state dollars uh, although he was able to secure that it took another state representative his uh, after him his Naomi Jacobson to actually right. free the money up and get it out of the budget and make it available for the school district to pay for the cost there so I do think that you're, you're always looking at who has the ability to deliver okay. the goods on so that. that's something for any organizer to sure to keep in mind. Now, to segue you from all this activism in the uh, Champaign County healthcare consumers and you can to your present position of executive director of community shares. And ah, yes. Uh, again, I. Beautiful uh, brochure. Yes, the beautiful brochure here. And um, as I mentioned previously, Esther Pat did come and talk in great detail about community shares. But what I'd like Mike to sort of talk about uh, as a person who started community shares, and it is part of a larger national organization, right. an umbrella organization, but where did your thinking progress so that you wanted to go from being um, a community organizer more on a local level, and now you've taken it up to the state level? Yeah. And, well, uh, Community Shares was created by local organizations, so uh, my involvement in, in helping to start it, originally our name was the Public Interest Fund of Illinois back in 91. Okay. It was that I was involved with healthcare consumers at the time, I was the executive director, and I worked with a number of other small grassroots organizations, and one of the things that is always a challenge, we were talking before having the resources, is having the resources to be able to carry out this work. And when you're challenging institutions in your community, or uh, you're challenging the powers to be wherever, you're often cut off from traditional sources of funding, whether that is, you know, if you're if you're criticizing the hospitals as we were often doing, and they're the largest, some of the largest employers, 
so they're on the United Way board, you're unlikely to get United Way funds to carry out the work of your organization. So okay. you have to find other ways to do that. Um, and at the time, there was a lot of work going on with what we call alternative funds, where grassroots organizations wanted to be able to raise money from the people in the community so that we aren't beholden to a government entity who funds us. But we would rather, most organizing situations, have our resources come to the people who we're organizing. So when we care about how is this going to affect us, the people who are giving us the money is who we care about, and we'd rather that be average individuals than maybe a, a government, a state mm -hmm. agency, something like that, where they can pull it if you're not following the right political line. So what Community Shares does is allow people in their workplace, average citizens, to have $5 a paycheck or $10 a paycheck come out and direct it to one of these organizations. And, and it's pretty broad over the years. Uh, community Shares started with 19 groups, went out to 74 across Illinois. Um, and it's a vehicle by which we're trying to build support, uh, general operating support for organizations that really struggle for that. So that we're not dependent on grants, we're not dependent on outside institutional support, but are able to get the money from average citizens. So that's a great vehicle for that. So that was sort of a natural, as I worked in a number of groups, and resources was always a challenge, is how do we expand those resources and how do we uh, strengthen and, and make them more stable. And you're talking about resources as to the economic resources. Right, contributions, individual contributions. contributions. Okay, right. not human. Not human, no. Human Although endeavor. what happens in workplace campaigns is that people are there at work and they get this list of charities who they can support and they say, oh, I didn't know about this group here and stuff like that. So it does tend to also give you your organization's exposure into the community. I mean, we always have people who will suddenly will get a check from someone that they never knew was out there and suddenly that person's given $500 and, and so community share serves as a vehicle for having individuals to hook up with their charities that they care about and for charities to find into people in the community who might want to support them and, and it does it through workplace giving and so it's a, it's a very democratic way of supporting kinds of organizations that I care deeply about. So it was sort of a natural progression in terms of that and um, as you mentioned community shares uh, is probably, we're probably about 30 uh, community shares around the country, some are citywide like in Milwaukee, uh, Cleveland, some are statewide, Tennessee, Colorado, Arizona. Mm -hmm. So they're different structures, but um, most of them, in fact all of them are sort of, sort of the bottom up, local grassroots groups coming together to create the community shares mechanism and, and just about three years ago we band together to create community shares of uh, community shares USA. Uh, and uh, oh, working together. Okay. Oh, okay. So, so that umbrella organization. So there's a now a national fairly organization. New. It's fairly okay. new, and it okay. wasn't that didn't exist, and then went out and started all the little ones. Got it. These all grew up, and and we had names like Public Interest Fund or Community Solutions Fund, and and so we're all moving toward a, a, a similar name and identity. So if someone moves from Colorado to Illinois and they see Community Shares, it's like, oh, I know Community Shares Colorado. I was supportive of that. So that there begin to be an identity of the types of organizations that are out there and. Um, People who move around will recognize us. From True grassroots from the bottom up. It's, yeah, it's very exciting. It, it is very exciting indeed. And um, Esther did explain this, but for those viewers who missed that program, would you again talk about how each organization gets money back Sure. to the organization and she talked about how if the volunteers do a little bit more work they sure. get so. so what we do is in a traditional in a different model is United Way where they'll tend to collect the money and then they give grants out to groups based on who they evaluate as meeting the needs that they see in the community. We tend to be more donor directed so we encourage people to select the organization so we have 70 some members. We encourage an individual if you care about peace you might want to support the 8th Day Center for Justice. If you care about housing you might want to support the tenant union and, and people so we encourage people to pick and choose and give their dollars where they want. And about two-thirds of the donations that we receive each year is someone designating to one of the member agencies. But the part where people say, gee, I like all these different groups, I'll let you decide how to divide it up. We don't say, well, we're going to give this group this much or that much. What we have is we're small, so we have what we call a sweat equity formula. So our member agencies participate in community shares, again, part of that sort of democracy and citizen participation right. is we encourage our members to get involved and they help in many ways in opening up new workplaces and reaching out in the community and so they earn sweat equity for all the kinds of activities that they do in community shares and at the end of the year we sort of add up how much sweat equity everyone earned and then we take that pot of money and we divide it up among our members based on how much time and effort they put into it so they're earning shares of the undesignated dollars that we receive each year. So they have a lot of bonding a lot. that, that it's happens. A great among the organization and those people who then work with the organization and the people who donate to the organization. Absolutely, yeah. 
It's, uh, a, it's a great model in terms of, again, sort of collaboration. Now, this is at a level of nonprofits collaborating together, but right. it brings together a great, and, and it's very diverse. Again, we cover uh, housing and homelessness. We have groups in health care. We have women and children. We have alternative media, you know, the Independent Media Center here, WEFT Radio. We're members of that in Chicago, Chicago Public Radio. We also have organizations addressing peace and justice issues. We have organizations... Um, like Acorn, which are fighting the Walmarts and the big box things up in Chicago, helping well, pass that. So, and they're really involved in New Orleans. And they're very involved in New Orleans, very and that's where their national headquarters were. And uh, were well, that and and just a plug for the the Department of Urban and Regional Planning. We're going to have between six and eight students working on projects down there. Oh, that's great. This this fall, along with uh, Acorn. And other institutions have done um, similarly, such as it's Cornell. So it's, a, it's quite an exciting group and yeah. working with lo about low-income housing. Right. So. And when Esther was on the program, we did run credits oh, the, of, of, all, the of all the different okay. organizations. <laughs> yeah, so them. those viewers who saw that show um, were able to scan that. And just to review for everybody, um, the website of Community Shares, so it's, if people want some more information. Sure. It's uh, www.cs-il.org. Uh, and so you can come there and, and they can see the list of our member organizations, learn about the work that they're doing, connect to their websites, stuff like that. Okay, I'm, I'm tying this all together here. And uh, you can, we are running that on this program, but um, why don't you give the contact information sure. for you can? Uh, the mailing address would be 411 West Park in Urbana, and a phone number would be 355 5169. Okay, and Nancy Greenwald. And Nancy Greenwald well, is there. a part time, very part time staff person who helps support. You okay, care. and the Champaign uh, County Healthcare Consumers. Um, all of these entities are together, in, and along with the tenant union, one branch of the tenant union, uh, in shared offices in. Right, in Champaign at 44 East Main and Suite 208. In the Lincoln Building. In the Lincoln Building, right. So, so practicing what they. Uh, uh, they preach about uh, collaboration, and I, I was curious, uh, with these groups and community shares, uh, now that uh, you have uh, grown so so much, have you um, discovered collaboration building between these groups or any serendipity that is beginning to happen with uh, similar interest groups? Well, it, it, we clearly have groups that are working on similar issues. I would say in many cases they know each other from those relationships outside of community shares, but in many cases groups are come together and they learn about what each other's doing and support each other's agenda. Our role as community shares isn't necessarily to push one issue or another, no, 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 but I it is a place where people come together, right. like-minded individuals working on similar issues. Do the organizations ever meet together? Oh yeah, we have quarterly meetings of our members. Oh, uh, you do? A couple so in they, Chicago, a couple of downstate each they year. They actually do come around the table and... Oh, absolutely. And our, we're structured in a way um, where our members are uh, empowered to make the decisions about it. So I really work for our member organizations and they uh, make the decisions about the policies we run, running uh, community shares, bringing in new members, things like that. So it's a very membership-based and very membership-run organization. And and to remind our viewers, when Esther was here, um, she did point out that if any organization wanted to be considered to become part of Community Shares, there is an application. Right, and they can go online. And we accept applications once a year, and we're uh, in mid-August to early November is the time frame when organizations can submit an application to us. To Good consider. timing So here. it's perfect timing. It, it's excellent timing. Um, well, you've covered a lot of things in relationship to community organizing and being a community organizer. So could you say hit um, three that you would emphasize as the key aspects mm -hmm. to keep in, in mind? Somebody is watching and they, they, they want to go out and organize their neighborhood or they've got some issues that are really... Sure. Um, it be, it become big. Well, let's take for example what's happened with Christie moving out of downtown right. Champaign. This is a very concrete example. Um, it's not a case study yet, but it's a concrete example of something that's recently happened in the community, and it's moved. It's it's going to move out to west of the intersection of two right. 
freeways and you have some concerns about it and you're a citizen of both communities. Uh, right. Well, you know, and it depends on what your position is. I know the Champaign County Healthcare Consumers has, I don't think they're opposed to Christie moving out, but I think there's some concerns about some of the facilities which will replicate facilities they already have and the impact that it's going to have. So um, groups like Champaign County Healthcare Consumers are actually organizing meetings and people who are okay. concerned about that should contact them specifically about All that right. issue. That's but I think if you're, if you're an average citizen and you have some concerns about it, you know, too often we're in our houses locked up from everyone else. And I remember growing up in Chicago in Catholic school, the nun always said, if you have a question, raise your hand because there's probably someone else in the room who wants to ask that too. And I just apply that. So if you're okay. somewhere and you have a concern about something going on in your neighborhood or there's an issue you care about, you know, reach out to someone else. Call an organization that might be addressing it because what you usually find is you're not alone. And once you realize that and you get together with other people who share your perspective, I think that's talking about it in terms of where are we at and what do we want. And we usually go through exercises where we sort of say, you're emperor. What do you want? And it's not that that's what you'll get, but think about what you want. What are the things that you care about? Uh, and come up with that list. And then the question is, well, who can give us those things? I mean, who can say, okay, we really want this. We want that stop sign. Who has the power to put a stop sign here? Uh, and then begin reaching to those people and talking to them about you, you as a group might want to do. But I think the first step really is starting talking to other people. You know, it's, maybe it's just over the fence in the backyard or you're at the grocery store and you see someone and you say, you know, what about that? I saw another car run through that street and the little girl almost got hit. You know, I'm just concerned about that. And what you'll find is other people often share what you think. Uh, and so then it's just a matter of bringing them together. It's just coffee and tea at the house sometimes. And uh, I think that people, once they hear it and, and know that they're not alone, often will begin to pull together some kind of effort to address that concern. And remember, it takes a long time. It takes a while, yeah. so you have and to be it persistent. And flows. That's right. And you don't always win, and you've got to be ready to compromise. But I do think when we engage ourselves in our communities uh, and try and get involved, that we're all better off for that. Open dialogue. Uh, absolutely. Thank you, Mike, very My much. Pleasure. Thank you for watching, and remember, planning matters.